Indra Nui, welcome to our show. Great to be here, Aarti and Sri Ram. I actually want to zoom in to your life as CEO. You were in rooms where you didn't look like the others in the room. You didn't have the same background. You had a different accent. When you talk, people should have a picture in their head of what you say. Talk vividly. Talk in a language that's crisp, clear, and simple. These days, everyone's a trailblazer. But for folks like us, you were truly one of those. Every one of us, especially who come as immigrants, who are very different, should focus extra hard on figuring out what is our proposition. There's no point having the proposition if you cannot communicate it effectively. All this talk about another downturn coming in, especially in the tech industry. What advice do you have for leaders? In retrospect, I'll be honest with you, Arati, I don't know how I did it. I really don't know. <laughs> Sometimes when I read my own book, I get tired. Die a founder or live long enough to see yourself being replaced by an Indian person. Till the last day of my CEO job, I had butterflies in my stomach. This is such a treat, such an honor. The person here needs absolutely no introduction. And we say this all the time, but truly this this person having here as our guest, you know, we've had her once before on the audio side, but now on YouTube is the first time we've had her and such a joy to have her here. Very, very accomplished. And, you know, we can talk about her achievements and uh, what she's done all day long. Uh, but I'm going to like just cut to the chase. Indra Nui, mm -hmm. welcome to our show. It's great to be here, Aarti and Sri Ram. I mean, your shows are always legendary and it's great to see you after such a long time. Uh, you still owe me pictures of your new baby. <laughs> what did you name him? A, B, C, D, E, F or something like so that? So we, we, <laughs> we have two kids. One, uh, our daughter's name is Indra in the exact same spelling as yours. Uh, uh -huh. And that, that gets a lot of comments, compliments when we go back, uh, especially to Chennai. And uh -huh. our second son, our son is named uh, Vishnu. Um, and he's 11 months old uh, as of today. You know, I wanted to start with this. We are from Madras, Chennai. So are you. What is it about people who were born in Chennai, who had an upbringing there that makes us the way we are and helps, you know, especially in, in your case, be incredibly successful? Well, all of us are successful. And, you know, it's amazing um, when I wrote the book and a lot of people read it, especially people from India and from Chennai. Everybody could relate to it. Everybody from yes. Chennai said, oh, that's exactly my family. Yes. And I want to step back from this and extract certain observations that apply, I think, to all of us. Um, we all grew up in Chennai, which is, I think, the nerd capital of the country. <laughs> uh, when I was growing up there at 8 o'clock, the city shut down. And you go to every house, the kid was doing the homework and studying hard. There was enormous respect for the older people. There was a discipline in the home. Uh, yes. There was simplicity in the way people lived, respect for the elders. We didn't have much. Most of us were middle class kids, didn't have much, but we were happy with what we had. Education, respect, and some focus on faith was what we all grew up with. Yes. When we were growing up, we didn't look at other people and said, they have so much. Mm -hmm. How come I don't have it? We were just happy with what we had. And I think in many ways, we grew up with in a background where there was freedom within a frame. All of our parents had hopes and dreams for us, but they had one foot on the brake, one foot on the accelerator. They gave us encouragement, but they also put a foot on the brake now and then. We hated it then, now and then, but then, you know, we lived with it because nobody else had it better than we did. And our parents worked awfully hard to mm -hmm. give us a better future. Mm -hmm. And when all of us crossed the oceans and came from one great democracy to another great democracy, we took all the education we got in India, all the hopes and dreams we had, and it realized itself in profound ways in the U.S. because the U.S. is that kind of a country. So I think that's why we can all relate to everything from the swing in the living room to how the grandparents were revered, to how they treated us, to how, I mean, I often talk about the fact that I don't think in my life and mother's ever hugged me and said, I love you. It's just <laughs> not done. Um, nobody was happy with the grades you got unless... It was as close to 100 as possible. Yeah. You know? and, and even then, they'd be like, you got 99? Who got 100? That was the first question. <laughs> this is, second this was is a like, comparison game. This is traumatizing, <laughs> bringing back so many unwelcome memories. And the second one would be, but where did the one mark go? What happened? Exactly. And you're like, but I, I made it there. Like, and I'm in the top 
you know, quartile or decile. I remember I got 87 in geography or something. I was telling my grandfather, I got the best mark in geography. So he looks at me and says, in a class of dancers, you got 87. That's very good. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, I better study some more. But you know, I think the other thing, Sri Ram and Arati, is that our parents and grandparents took our education personally yeah. for them. Yeah. If we got a bad grade, they felt they had not done their job. So the grandparents who lived with us in many cases, we all had multi-generational families. Yes. They felt vested in our education. And I think it's a combination of all of that that makes me, in retrospect, extremely happy that I grew up in that environment. But I'm also equally happy that I moved out of that environment and came to the United States because I could spread my wings and really That's right. Fly. That's right. Um, you know, this word trailblazer gets thrown around quite a lot, especially like these days, everyone's a trailblazer. Uh, yeah. But for, for folks like us, you were truly one of those. You know, we you were the person we looked up to growing up being like, oh, my God, one day we have to be like her. Um, what did it mean for you at that time? You know, you were the first in many cases, you know, uh, uh, leaving India, coming here, mm -hmm the you know the career that you've had uh you know later we should talk about pepsi and you know obviously a lot of the work and accomplishments there but what did it mean for you to be a trailblazer through your career i never thought of it as a trailblazer then because at every point i was just working very hard and hoping that i was doing the right thing and you know one thing led to another to bigger and bigger jobs and you know i started to ascend the problem is when you get moved higher and higher in an organization the organization sees you as being very capable and you know capable of doing that next job. Mm -hmm. But when you get that next job, you're scared out of your mind because mm -hmm. you don't want to let your company down. You don't want to let your boss down. You don't want to let your family down. You don't want to let India down. You don't want to let your family, you know, your birth family down. Yeah. And you don't want to let the U.S. down because the country gave me such a big opportunity. So I felt I had the weight of everything on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. So I'd work extra hard on the next job. So little by little, as I moved up, all my personal time went away. Any little personal time I have went away because I focused all the time on being good at my job and then learning more so that uh, you know I could do this job better than anybody else. That was my focus always because the company I thought deserved that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'd say contrary to what people think that when you get the next job, you're euphoric and you feel like, oh my God, I've conquered the world. You're actually going with butterflies in your stomach. At least yeah. I did. Yeah. And I was never in a job where I said, oh, I can rest and relax and uh, I've landed. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Till the last day of my CEO job, I had butterflies in my stomach. I want to touch on something which you know you just brought up, which is, you know, you, you are often, you know, especially I think early on in your career, you were in rooms where you didn't look like the others in the room. You didn't have the same background. You know, you had a different accent. And, uh, you know, you kind of wondered, hey, do I fit in here? It's something which I can definitely, Aati can definitely relate to because we didn't grow up here. You know, uh, we didn't go to MIT or Stanford. And, you know, we often didn't sound like a lot of the others in the room. And we had, I definitely had like huge imposter syndrome for a long period of time. And I think a lot of folks listening to this, you know, um, and they may not be from India or elsewhere, but they may just be like, hey, I'm in a situation where I don't fit in for whatever reason. One, how was it for you? And what were sort of like tools or approaches that you used to maybe deal or overcome that? That's a great, great question. So let me start off by saying most of my life, <clears throat> I was the only one of its kind in the room. Hmm. Because remember, the time that I was coming through corporate America, there weren't many women in senior jobs, definitely not colored immigrant women from an emerging market sitting in the halls of power. And so I always felt like I was completely different, but I never focused on that, okay? Because I knew that when I walked in, the way I felt was there was a cloud over that person's head and they're going, what is this woman doing here? What mm -hmm. does she know about my business? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, what gives her the right to be in this uh, hall of power? Mm -hmm. That's what I assumed. People never told me that. That's what I assumed they were thinking. So what did I do? I decided that, I'm not going to win this based on how I look because I didn't know how to dress. Nobody gave me tips until much later in life. Um, it's not the way I talked because I certainly had an accent. Uh, and uh, I, looked, I looked different. So I, I assumed I was getting about 100 negative points because of that. So I walked in and said, I'm only going to win on one thing. 
I'm going to show that I know the material better than anybody else and I can add more value than anybody else. So for every meeting, I was over-prepared, over, over, over-prepared. And if I had to read dust, you know, this much material, I would read actually twice as much. I mm -hmm. would read stuff around it mm -hmm. to be able to improve the quality of my contributions at the meeting. Now, I'm going to touch on a very, very important point. This is one of perhaps one of the most important points I want your viewers to take away. Every one of us, especially who come as immigrants, who are very different, uh, should focus extra hard on figuring out what is our proposition to the company? What is our proposition? What do I mean by that? If they look at you, Arati, or you, Sriram, they should be able to say, this is what Arati brings to the table. This is what Sriram brings to the table. And that proposition has to be clear and it's got to be differentiated. When this came home to me was, I was working for this German guy called Gerhard Schulmeier in Motorola. Mm -hmm. When he left Motorola to go run a big piece of Asia Brown Bavaria, the headhunter called me and said, Mr. Schulmeier is looking for an Indra Nui. What does it mean? <laughs> it made me pause and say, what does being an Indra Nui mean? So I wrote down on a piece of paper everything I did for him and realized that the stuff I would do as the head of strategy and his chief of staff was stuff that was so broad and so integrative that it made the CEO's life easier. Mm -hmm. And that carried through later on. And as I moved up, I had to refine what I was offering. So I think it's very, very important that all of us, if we want to win on competence, not on anything else, because we're not going to win on the others, we have to make sure that we have a damn good proposition that's articulated and that's differentiated. And there's no point having the proposition if you cannot communicate it effectively. Mm -hmm. So the plea that I would have for immigrants in particular, invest the time to become a good communicator, oral and written, mm -hmm. specifically oral communication. Simplify the message. When you talk, people should have a picture in their head of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Talk vividly. Talk in a language that's crisp, clear, and simple. And if you did that, you become quite invaluable. Proposition, communication. Wow, wow. that's fantastic. Um, you know, our, our audience, a lot of folks are people in tech, uh, young kids thinking about starting companies, trying to be entrepreneurs. We recently, we went back to Chennai and we had our first ever, you know, meetup for the podcast and it was oh. amazing. We'd never seen, we, we honestly thought, you know, maybe like 10 people would show up and kind of be like, yeah, I listen to you too. Uh, hundreds of people, packed stage. Wow. I'm not um, surprised. You should have asked me and I told you. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really great and overwhelming. And we realized that one of the things that really uh, stood out for us is how many people are so early in their careers there and who are listening to conversations like this and who are trying to form their worldview on what to go build, how to be a good leader, how to communicate better, all of that. And, you know, we recently watched, uh, we watched a masterclass. We are like huge fans of it. You talk about performance with a purpose. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, I think that, you know, when people get up and come to work, okay, they want to work for a company where, you know, you're going to be a positive force yeah. in society. Yep. doesn't matter what your past is. In the future, going forward, you're going to be a positive force. You can't just say, I create jobs. It's way more than that today. So in the case of PepsiCo, what is, what is the reason for our existence? Mm -hmm. We had a set of products in the past which were right for society those days. Society was changing. We had to change with the times. So whether it's changing the portfolio, changing our environmental footprint, changing the way we treat employees, we had to make those changes. Mm -hmm. But we also had to deliver performance. So the whole articulation of performance of purpose was PepsiCo will continue to be a high performance company, but we want you to come and join the company because we have a singular purpose mm -hmm. to nourish our consumers differently, to replenish the environment as we go along and to really cherish our people. That's the focus of this company. And it's not taking away products. It is creating a more balanced range of products, fun for you, better for you, good for you. So that, consumers of infinite choice. So by articulating the direction of the company based on where the consumer was going anyway, it gave everybody a sense of optimism coming to work in the company every day, as opposed to, you know, we make soda and chips, which are great. I consume a lot of them myself, but we do it in a different way now. That's all. And so performance with purpose is sort of 
articulating the inner passion of the company or the raison d'etre for the existence of the company in a different way. And that's what we were trying to do. And it is sustained now for my 12 years as a CEO and still sustaining in a different set of words in PepsiCo today. By the way, I think you should know this. Uh, I have the right brand uh, be- be- beverage. Of char- man. I know, There's right? Man. Uh, incredibly refreshing. You know, it's funny. When I was back at... Uh, back work on ads at Facebook, etc. You know, when you would have, uh, you know, the team from Pepsi or the other unnamed beverage maker show uh-huh. up, there'd be some sort of people who would go run around and make sure every refrigerator right. on that floor was uh-huh. stocked appropriately, right? And right. it was a whole thing, right? Like, and, you know, and I, we knew, and, you know, when somebody's showing up, and this would also be true for Nike and Adidas, where yep. you know, if somebody was showing up, Somebody will go on the floor and they'll be like, hey, you can't be wearing that, right? Like, you, you can you can wear something neutral, but you can't be wearing that, right? And uh, so I always like that. But it, I actually wanted to tie this in, uh, tie this back to, uh, you know, the idea of competitions. You at Pepsi and, you know, we t- uh, I work a lot with founders who are intensely competitive. And, uh, you know, how was it to kind of run a company which you famously broadened the portfolio of? But for a lot of people in the public, you know, they've always been locked in competition with, you know, like this other player, right? And this kind of plays on yeah. different industries in different ways. So how do you, how does that help hinder the company's psychology? How do you just yeah. think about, you know, competition when it's just out there in public in such a, bra- a public oh, manner? Sure, that's another wonderful question. i tell you something. In PepsiCo, the culture of the company is that if we didn't have a competitor, we'd invent a competitor. Mm-hmm. So the one thing with the beverage business, it has two and a half great competitors. There's two major players and it has a whole bunch of little guys. So I always say we had two and a half great competitors in the marketplace. And each one made the other better, right. which was great. Our basis of competition was very different. Many people didn't realize that, but we had great companies. In Friedel, you know what used to happen? Since Frito is such a big salty snack player, um, I remember when Pringles was about two share. We said, mm-hmm. oh, good, now we have a competitor. <laughs> this is, I'm talking now in the 90s, yeah. uh, early 2000s. In Frito, they had floor mats made with the Pringles mustache man <laughs> with a line across it. And every morning when people came to work, they would stamp that mat and go. <laughs> okay? Not that, you know, Pringles was any competition. It was, you know, a very differentiated product. It had yeah. two share at that time. Yeah. But competition fires up people. Yeah. And I would say to a lot of the tech people, sometimes you think your innovation should stand on its own. And you talk about it as if it's the holy grail. But if you expand your definition and say, hey, look, we're a bit player in a bigger space. And we have a lot of competitors who are going to come at us in every which way. You wouldn't have a lot of the tech companies struggling like many of them are doing today. Hmm. And I think this whole issue of competition is something that needs to be deeply embedded into any startups. I uh, think uh, like- you, I think you're catching on to something there, which is, you know, competition fires up people. I've noticed that competition fires a certain set of people and it's great. It's, you know, you can see it in them. And I think a lot of people I worked with at uh, Meta at Facebook were like that, where similar to what you'd mentioned if they see a competitor, they would get so charged up, so fired up. And it is such great fun to work with them, not because there is like this other competitor in the room, but because there is this camaraderie of like a common purpose against somebody else or against this other company. But I've also seen this uh, only in tech, but go the other way where people just get like really weakened. They're not excited where they give up too quickly. And a lot of it, I think, is psychology at play. How do you inspire, you know, you've managed thousands of people. How do you inspire teams to lead through winning and through change and all of that in Pepsi or anywhere else? It's very hard. It's very, very hard because this is not a a little sprint. It's a marathon. You've got Mm -hmm. to keep running this race forever. You've got to keep growing. You've got to keep innovating. You can't tell people, let's do it for two years and after that we can all rest. This is something that you've got to keep innovating constantly. Yeah. And it's not just competition. Competition might change based on how the marketplace is changing or who's coming in or new technologies coming in. So you've got to constantly, um, you know, it used to be, I used to do something when I was at PepsiCo from around the world and around the U.S. Every quarter at different times, they would deliver boxes and boxes of competitive products. Mm-hmm. 
And then on a particular day, I'd bring the senior team together and say, we're going to just taste all these products. And anything that's good, we're going to keep it aside and figure out why it's so good and how come we didn't think about it. You know, that created camaraderie. Mm -hmm. It created a, a desire on our part to understand what the world was, you know, what was changing in the world, what competition was doing. But it was a relentless focus, mm -hmm. relentless. And here again, another lesson that somebody taught me. They said the distance between a number one and number two is a constant. So if you want to raise the talent in the company, the number one person has to raise themselves up. So that distance is always a constant. Mm -hmm. So whoever's the boss, you become a lifelong student and raise the rest of the team. If you don't do that, you should go because then the gap is narrow and you should get out. And so I realized that if I wanted my team to get better and better, I had to be a student myself. I had to look at competition myself. Mm -hmm. I was out in the marketplace every weekend looking at stores, competition, consumer behavior, constantly, mm -hmm. globally. And I think leaders should set the example of the kind of tone and approach they want for the rest of their company. You know, I, I love the story of where you would have these ch chiefs of staff who are these incredibly senior leaders and yes. they do a tour of duty uh, learning from you yeah. for 18 months or so. And they would accompany you on these trips to the local marketplace and they would be like, well, if you're go going around to the Indra, you're going to be like, well, you're going to come with something where that product was in the right shelf. Or and That's kind of interesting because I've sometimes seen CEOs be above it all. Too abstracted out. Yeah, and yeah. then delegate the, you know, kind of like having the, the, the battlefield instincts to a strategy team or a, uh, a research team a customer or research a, team a, worst of all, a con external consulting firm. Yeah. So was it something you consciously did, which was like, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to see how these things are actually used, taste? Yeah, you see, we're a consumer brand and our distribution system push the product. Mm -hmm. The consumer has to pull the product. Mm -hmm. OK, and, uh, you know, the push and pull we spend media. We, we have media that we rent, which is advertising and, you know, all of those methods. And then media we own, which is our packages on the shelf, the trucks with the logos on the side. That's media we own, right? Our packaging is what we own. Now, when you go to the shelf, if that is a form of media and advertising and it doesn't look so good, that's wasted advertising money. Just as we judge how our commercials do with consumers, we have to judge what the advertising on the shelf looks like because putting our product on the shelf is a billboard effect. Mm. So I look at the package and say, if the circle in a Pepsi logo has to overlap perfectly in the package flap and it doesn't, it destroys, it's, it's jarring. Mm -hmm. wow. okay, so I, I think you that. guys change the design or fix the flap machine. You can't have a design where the uh, flap should come together and form the circle, but it forms two half circles. Can wow. can be okay. Wow. <laughs> so I hear things like the alignment in the machine is wrong. I said, okay, let's go to the factory. Let's fix it now. That's amazing. I, I, that's, I, I, like I love the that. It's kind of like the attention to detail. You know, we won't let Steve Jobs, but you know, the kind of Steve Jobs, you know, like attention to detail. I actually want to kind of zoom in to on your kind of your life as CEO, which is for a lot of people listening to this, um, your you know, career seems so far away and, you know, so abstract, you know, and I'm kind of curious about if you could break down what a day in the life or a week in the life over those 12 years, like, look like, how did you think about organizing your time? What were your personal routines and systems? What did a good day at the office look like? <laughs> One of the problems of being CEO of such a large company in particular, and remember those days, there wasn't much technology like what we are deploying today. Yeah. Um, I knew my calendar down to the minute for the next 12 months. Oh, man. <laughs> Every day. Down to minutes, okay? For the next two years, I knew, I would say 60% of the calendar was scheduled. <laughs> and for the next three to four years, 50% of the calendar was scheduled. Because we had quarterly earnings, a prep for earnings, strat plans, budgets, quarterly reviews, budget reviews. All of that was on the calendar. International trips, everything calendarized out. So... Your wiggle room is very little. So what you have to do is force on it, uh, you know, school plays. So I'd call the school uh, very early and say, give me all of the dates that I have to put on the calendar because I want to be there for all the school events for my kids. Yeah. That's the one thing I never missed. Mother-daughter liturgy, uh, school events. I went to all of them. Um, but a typical day is I would get up maybe 4 or 5 a.m., have my uh, good South Indian filter coffee, 
I couldn't do without that. That's my big vice. So I would have my <laughs> South Indian coffee. And I don't want anybody waking up at that time. That's my time. I would read my uh, newspapers. And then um, by five o'clock, I've started to read the mail that mm -hmm. I have to go through, the reports mm -hmm. for the day's meeting. And by 7.45, 8, I'm in the office. And I go from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock nonstop, no breaks. Mm -hmm. Even over lunch, there'll be meetings. Wow. And it'll be program meetings, meetings that were suddenly put on because of some emergency. Um, you know, somebody might just drop in and say, need two minutes with you, it's urgent. You know, then you rearrange the whole calendar. So we had two assistants that would constantly rearrange the calendar. Mm. And, you know, around five, I'd go home, spend some time with the kids and have dinner. And then back to reading. You know, by 7.30 or 8, I'm back to reading. I read till midnight, then go to bed at midnight, wake up at 4. So I didn't sleep much, but I read. I mean, people would call me a bag lady because I used to leave the office with two or three bags of mail or reports to read. I like to read hard copies. I don't like to read it digitally. At least we didn't even have it then, but I read everything digitally. Yes. And I, as I said, I used to read everything. So if somebody gave me a 400-page report, I read every page not because I didn't trust them, it's because I respected them. I thought if they took the time and the energy to write a 400 page report, there must be enormous nuggets of uh, profound data in it. So I would read everything and if I was writing that, I might have written it in 20 pages, but they wrote it in 400, that's okay. I read it. Very often I was the only one who read it. Mm. <laughs> that was a different problem. Yeah. But uh, that was my day, uh, Sriram. And it was relentless. How it do you... Relentless. Um, every, every time we chat, Indra, or every time I watch one of your interviews, I am always inspired to see how much hard work goes into it. And it is just... You can you can have all these other abstractions around like what career cost you to be successful, but you cannot take away the fact that you worked incredibly hard to every single day, as you mentioned, how do you, do you believe in burnout? How do you avoid burnout? Is that such a thing? Or at that point, was it just not a thing that ever entered your consciousness? How do you think, deal with it? I don't think it entered my consciousness because if mm -hmm. I burned out, the job would suffer, the family would suffer. Because right. remember, I had to worry about all of these competing priorities. Right. And my husband had a full-time job too, so it's not as if he was available all the time. So right. uh, the question of burnout, <clears throat> did not enter my lexicon at all. Got it. Okay. There were days here and there that I'd be tired, but I realized that the show must go on. Yeah. You know, sense. my grandfather telling me always, if you promise to deliver something, make sure you do. Yeah. Uh, and so I never allowed sickness to get me down either. Yeah. So I would just say, got to keep going, got to keep going. And I just kept going. In retrospect, I'll be honest with you, Arati, I don't know how I did it. I really don't know. <laughs> Sometimes when I read my own book, I get tired. I say, did I do all this? <laughs> oh my God, how did I do it? So oh, it, was, uh, it was a race. It was uh, being on the pedal all the time. You were uh, famous <clears throat> for uh, sending notes to parents of you know, folks on your leadership team. Yeah. You basically, you know, you started that whole thing and it was very, it's a very unique thing. Why did you do that? What what made you start that whole tradition? This is a very uh, Chennai thing because I went home after uh, I became CEO. My mom was there and she said, just get dressed and sit in the living room. I did. And neighbors, second cousins, third cousins, fifth cousins, neighbor, all started to show up one by one. They'd walk into the house, they look at me and say, oh, congratulations. Oh, you're Indra, so congratulations. They'd go straight to my mother and say, Mrs. Krishnamurti, you brought up your daughter so well. You did well. Oh, <laughs> you did. Yes. That caused the daughter to be this. And my mother would sit there and go, yeah, I used to tell prayers four hours a day. Yes. I fasted for two days of the week. <laughs> yes, you don't know all the problems I went through, but all of this, God gave me the ability to... Yeah. Uh, you know, to have these kids grow up well. <laughs> so all the credit went to her. <laughs> yeah. I was just a prop. So I came back here and I said, oh my God, how come I gave no credit to the parents of my executives? <laughs> so I wrote to all of them, giving them a little background on myself. And then I explained what their son or daughter was doing for PepsiCo. You know, and because it's going to be a positive report card, right? Yeah. So I wrote them all. And um, then I wrote about 
300 uh, executives of PepsiCo mm -hmm. by the time I was through. I wrote to the parent. I always wrote to the spouses, but I wrote to the parent. It unleashed emotions like you won't believe it. The parents started write to me. Um, if the son or daughter went home and said one thing negative about me, they'd say, uh-uh, she's my friend. <laughs> so it built a bond between them and me. And um, it was a fantastic relationship. All the letters the parents wrote me, I still kept it because occasionally I would read uh, the letter. I remember one of our executives in India, he works in Dubai. He said to me that his father uh, made 100 copies of the letter, <clears throat> sat in the in a chair in the ground floor of his apartment building. Everybody who came in and said, this is the letter that the chairman of my son's company wrote about my son. Here, take a copy. <laughs> I, you know, I, I was so proud. I, I love that. So that much. is a very Indian parent thing to do, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just want to say, by the way, we've had on lots of interesting guests, uh, but two of the most ardent viewers of our show are Arthi's parents. So they would be so <laughs> impressed with this episode. They'd be like, oh, okay, I don't know about all the other folks, but you finally have a legit guest and conversation. So you're going to be very, very impressed. And this is going to be <laughs> broadcast to all the relatives on a big TV I should screen. write to them, though. I should I, write to both your parents to tell them what <laughs> awesome kids they brought up. I also <laughs> think um, for us as kids, as uh, children, I think the bar is so high. You never get praise from your parents. That's so exactly right. when you, the one time when you actually get <clears throat> praised, you're like, I must have done something really big. This is, you know, this never happens normally. And it's also like never direct praise to you. It's, you know. It's always the third party. Yeah, it's like I went and to the so temples. I don't know why this habit <laughs> exists with our Southern Indian parents? No, I, even today, my mother will not praise me. Because I think it just get they are worried that it gets to our head and then we would like stop performing and stop At being age, with I mean, I said, Mom, <laughs> come on, give me a break. I she remember you didn't want to say NS what the hell did you <laughs> It's like when she told me to leave the crown in the garage. I mean, that was the elegant way I translated it. So you don't want to hear what she actually told me. But you know, always taking you down a peg or two. Personally, yeah. I don't care. But sometimes I wish it was just unbridled thank you. you know? I mean, I, I see that with uh, our American co-workers and I'm like, oh, wow, like they just said that. They just said they're like really proud of them. They just, you know, it's it's very direct and uh, we don't have that because it's just not in our culture. Right. I remember in 10th standard, 11th standard, our my principal wrote a handwritten note to my parents being like, she's one of the top students in our school. Uh -huh. uh, we are really happy and excited to have her here. We hope that the next two years go really well and she's going to like do well. Very like normal note, end of the year. And they sent it through me and my dad opened it and was like, what does she want? Like, why did, <laughs> <laughs> why did she send this note? Um, are you not doing well? Is she trying to be like, you need to work hard the next two years? And I'm like, no, it's the opposite. I am one of the top people in the class. And she's like, he's like, as you okay. should be. As you, should be. <laughs> it, you know, the worst part is in my 11 years in Holy Angels Convent, my mother, father have never visited the school even once. <laughs> yeah. Wow. No even once yeah yeah i mean i believe that um <laughs> because there was no culture of them visiting the school mm -hmm. and um the nuns came to our house for coffee so if you wanted a report card on us person to person the nuns gave mm -hmm. it to my parents in person so they never came to the school so they never questioned a teacher on why didn't my daughter just get 95 and not 100 here yeah, the teacher's right. Yeah, you know we're gonna have teacher was right. We're gonna have two parts of audience. Our Indian audience is gonna be like, "Oh my god, this is exactly us." They're gonna get triggered, and everyone's <laughs> like, "What the heck is going on?" So it's gonna be exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I, I want to tie it back to the technology industry. So we've been seeing this trend, and I mean, you were obviously a trailblazer, but you know, in CPG, but in technology, you know, the running joke is like, "Die a founder or live long enough to see yourself being replaced by an Indian person." And <laughs> uh, you know, from you know, Microsoft to you know the Adobe to. Uh, Google. Uh, 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 obviously Google um, and for a time Twitter. So you kind of have these, um, you know, they kind of have a similar pattern, which is they're typically not founders, but they are typically, you know, they kind of work their way up the corporate ladder, have a long history of delivering results and um, usually uh, liked by all. Uh, you know, not controversial, and um, and this almost they kind of all fit into some similar patterns. So obviously, all accomplished in own ways. Why do you 
think that is, right? Why are we suddenly seeing, you know, all these iconic tech companies definitely have Indian CEOs in place? I, you know, I wish I knew the answer. First of all, I think that tech companies have to go through constant disruption, mm. constant. It requires enormous courage. It requires enormous commitment. And it requ requires enormous technical knowledge. You can't just run it for the size of the company it is. You've got to run it as a constantly disrupting machine. Mm. And so typically in those companies, they look for the best technical brain who's willing to have the conviction to make the change. And very often it's the Indian guys who bubbled up to the top, who speak mm. English, who have the conviction, who look, who look sufficiently nerdy. <laughs> and I mean it in the complimentary way, not yeah. in a negative way. I mean yeah. it in a complimentary way. I look at Sundar or Satya, you look at them, you feel comfortable. You say, <laughs> they know the technology. Thank yeah. God. Mm -hmm. This is not a showy person. This is a person who's going to get this company moving again. I'm, I'm, I'm now wondering what Indra thinks of when she looks at Not me. that. Not that. Okay, <laughs> all right. Let's moving right along. Moving right along. <laughs> and so I think it's very, very important that we understand, you know, why we are sent to those jobs. All of the, if you look at the heads of all of the tech companies who are Indian, they evoke a sense of comfort that yeah. they know what they're doing. Yeah. And I think that's really one of the reasons why senior Indian executives ascend to the top in tech companies. And, uh, you know, and that's why I think in many ways, my coming to the top of PepsiCo was a surprise, mm -hmm. uh, Sriram, because this was not a tech company. This is a mainstream red, white, and blue consumer company. Yeah. And it's like, what the hell are they doing? Putting an Indian woman to run the uh, the company. I, I was going to get into this next, which is you know, the other kind of theme in Silicon Valley is uh, sometimes that you need to be a founder to take bold changes. Um, and um, and this kind of this almost this divine energy that the founder brings. Uh, and one of the things which is very interesting about you is, you know, you're obviously not the founder of PepsiCo, but you made some really bold, dramatic changes. And I'm curious because, you know, for mm -hmm. Folks who are here, you know, who are not founders and who are maybe working up the way to the corporate ladder, who may be CEOs themselves, like what was, what did it feel like? Were you afraid? Did you feel like you had the power, the the divine right uh, uh, to make those changes? Because you are different from, say, somebody who's like actually built a company from day zero. I actually thought I was the founder of PepsiCo. Mm. That was the amazing part. Mm. I came into the company in '94 when took the company through so much transformation. There was never a day that passed in PepsiCo where I didn't believe it was my company. And my bosses allowed me to feel that way. Yeah. <clears throat> they empowered me, they entrusted me, they included me. So I felt this was my company and my job was to leave the company better than I found it. I already found it in a great shape. My predecessor had done a great job. I wanted to leave it in a better place. Mm. And you remember that poem, The Brook, that we all studied from by Tennyson. Yeah. Or men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. That's what the brook says as it flows along. I looked at PepsiCo and said, men may, you know, CEOs may come, CEOs may go, but this company has got to go on forever. So I, ha I felt I had this intergenerational responsibility. I had to execute to make sure that the company was reinvented for the future constantly. And it's that feeling of ownership that allowed me to push myself to crazy levels. And um, I think most CEOs of PepsiCo have felt that way about the company. That's what's unusual about PepsiCo. And that's why we breed so many CEOs. I mean, yesterday, the day before, there are these articles about PepsiCo is the single biggest CEO machine in the, in the country today. I think uh, there are 16 CEOs who've been through the PepsiCo Academy just in the last eight to 10 years. And so, um, it's because we have an ownership culture. We give people the ability to uh, sink or swim, you know, and they, most of them swim. Uh, and we allow failure as long as they learn from failures. So it's a great culture. Yeah. A big company with a lot of founder cultures. Yeah, that's <clears> right. <throat> um, you know, through the 12 years uh, and beyond, you've led Pepsi, Pepsi go through, you know, different you know, economic recession, just times of change as such. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, there is all this talk about another downturn coming in, uh, especially in the tech industry. This is all the conversation now on how should tech companies deal with it. We talk, there's a lot of conversation about layoffs. When we think about like early stage startup founders, how should they plan uh, for an upcoming recession, all of that. 
What advice do you have for leaders uh, as they see a company through change uh, over the course of a few years and whatever the time span might be? I think we'll just separate out two or three things. One is, if you are truly an efficiency-driven company, you shouldn't worry because recession or not, people are going to want you right. for efficiency. Second, if you built a company where there's too many people, a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> fluff that you've built into the company, use the recession as a great time to delayer and make it more efficient. Use it as an right. opportunity. Right. Don't lament that a recession is coming. Right. Third, and I'm saying this with all modesty, I think that because the equity markets were so hot, yeah. a lot of the companies were just, the valuations were crazy. And they still haven't come back to earth, but they're slowly coming back to earth. So I look at these and say, should we lament them? I don't think so. I think there's an adjustment going on. Hmm. I think the core economy is still solid, it's still uh, functioning well. Uh, if you are a company that's going to deliver efficiency or effectiveness to a company, you should do well. But if you're a purely discretionary item mm -hmm. built on too many layers of management and too many perks, hey, light now. Uh, uh, I was going to ask you this uh, later, but I think it's a good segue, which is, uh, you obviously pay a lot of attention to the tech industry. We've talked a lot, uh, you know, our background about tech, uh, stuff happening in tech. What do you think are lessons the tech industry could learn, absorb, you know, maybe from your time at PepsiCo or in general? And vice versa, what do you think some of the broader lessons, uh, folks in sort of the consumer packaged goods, uh, uh, people who make things that we drink and eat, what do you think they could learn from the folks in Silicon Valley? It's interesting. I, th I think we wanted to learn more from you guys. And I didn't think there's nothing, I, I thought there was nothing you could learn from us. I've come to think differently. So let me explain what I mean. Typically established companies like us who are in what they call traditional industries are viewed differently by the stock market. Hmm. If the tech industry was valued like we were, your valuations would be much lower. Hmm. But you shouldn't be valued like you, we are because your growth rates are much higher hmm. and uh, you're doing things to disrupt the world. Okay. So very often you're all priced to concept but not really priced to what can this technology really do. Hmm. And then when the air is let out, let out of the uh, bag, people go, oh my God, this company you know, is, is not worth this much. In the first place, it was not. You just didn't realize it. You just priced it to concept because it was hype around it. Hmm. So I think what the tech industry can learn from the traditional industries is how do investors look at these companies? And let us adopt not all of them, not all the lessons, but let's adopt, adopt some of those practices as we think of managing our companies. My only request is don't hold back on growth mm. because of how investors perceive you. Because you have to invest for growth. You've got to invest ahead of growth. Just keep growing because growth is at a premium always. Mm. But grow responsibly. Think about organizational bandwidth. Think about what you can actually handle in terms of growth. Mm. And... As you invest for growth, in the back of your head, think about at what point in this growth cycle can I expect to get returns? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be today. Is it going to be in 10 years, in five years? Do you see a line of sight to improve profitability? Mm -hmm. If all that you see is a line of sight to losses, think hard. At some point, investors are going to wise up and say, this stock is not for us. Interesting. I remember that some company was, whose name I shall not mention <laughs> went out for a ridiculous valuation, absolutely ridiculous valuation. I was with the founders like a week after the company went public and I said, hey, what the hell is this? This is a valuation that makes no sense. His immediate reaction was, I don't care, in six months my lockup is gone, I'm gonna sell my stock and get out. Huh. Yeah. <clears throat> and the valuation of the company right now is in the toilet. So I, I look back and I say, I think it's nice to have a valuation go to the stratospheric levels, but know that it's going to come back to earth. At some point, people are going to look at revenue and profits. Mm. So think hard about how you talk about the company, how you present it, because the worst thing that can happen is it shoots up and collapses, it, it rather than having a nice arc of growth. There's a couple of things, I think, which make it really hard for tech companies to, because I think a lot of people know that they have to do what you just said. I think the hard things are, number one is they live in a market where if you're competing for talent, 
if you're competing for partnerships, you're going to get mimetically compared to everyone around you. So, yeah. you know, if you are not, you know, one of these buzzy companies, which is being covered as fast growing valuation, um, you're going to find it really hard to get that hot shot 25 year old computer science engineer, you know, which makes it different. So there is sort of a market mimetic reflexive nature to these things, uh, mm. which makes it somewhat challenging. Um, the second part of it is it's really hard for, I think, founders and CEOs to talk down valuations. You're the- right. You're 100% correct. Right. Because evaluation is said, said by shareholders who don't really understand your company, don't understand the technologies. I mean, all that you have to look at recent failures and say, did people really understand the companies? Okay. So I come, you're absolutely right, Shiram. And I, <clears throat> I'm torn because on the one hand, I say to myself, if investors are that smart, why don't they spend the time understanding the company and the technology? Hmm. Why hmm. drive it to so much valuation, then complain when the valuations come down? Hmm. Okay. You drove it up. The company didn't. <laughs> you drove it up. All right. So that's one side. On the other hand, what I don't want to happen is companies cut back on investing for growth. Because I think if you look at all the big companies of today, had they stopped investing in growth, they wouldn't be around yeah. today. Yeah. And we wouldn't have these amazing Googles and Amazons and yeah. Microsofts and uh, uh, you know NVIDIA. So yeah. I think you've got to keep investing for growth. Just be careful in thinking through organizational bandwidth. Are you putting in the foundations to build a great company? Yeah. Are you thinking about all the processes? Because once you get big, you have to think process. Otherwise, you can't run the company and keep it together. Mm-hmm. Are you building that infrastructure? Yeah, the most important? makes sense. Um, I wanted to talk about your, you meeting Steve Jobs. And uh, mm-hmm. you'd mentioned this before, and it's such a fun anecdote. Uh, you know, for us, the context is we grew up uh, very typical kind of in the tech industry. You know, uh, we worked at Microsoft early on in our careers, but we wanted to come to Silicon Valley. Uh, and part of it was because we were so inspired by Steve Jobs and his vision. Uh, almost where when we first came down here on like a trip, we hadn't even moved here. The first thing we did, well, the first thing we did was go to Sarona Bhavan uh, and uh, have a good meal. And uh-huh. then from there, we looked up Google Maps and it said Cupertino, it's like right there, the, you know, the Apple campus. So we drove around it, hoping to catch Steve Jobs on some weekend afternoon. He wasn't there then. I think at that time he was already. Yeah, by the way, for folks watching this, do not try this because Apple's security will not look fondly upon <laughs> this. But sorry, go on. But, you know, for us, uh, you know, we grew up idolizing Steve Jobs and what he's done and what he's built and the legacy is still, you know, it's everlasting. Uh, how was your uh, interaction with him? Well, you know, I think Dean Ornish, who is a doctor in California, a very well known uh, nutritionist, um, thought as a new CEO, now thinking about design, I had to go and see Steve Jobs because he was the father of design. Now, I didn't expect Steve Jobs to give me the time of day. So when I got the call saying he's going to give you time, go visit with him, I was surprised. And um, uh, I had heard from advertising agencies and other people that were common between Apple and us that he's a very difficult client. He has high standards. If you don't deliver, he gets really mad and throws the presentation across the room and so people go in there saying we want to do our best for him so there was a desire to raise your game for Steve Jobs so right. to me just like you I was in awe of the man but I thought of you know sitting at the foot of the master and mm. learning something mm. he had just come back from his first bout of illness he was very gracious um, he was very direct he gave me more time than I anticipated did tell me that design thinking had to permeate everything we were doing at PepsiCo. <clears throat> he gave me examples of things that PepsiCo had not done right in the past. Mm. He told me, gave me examples of stuff I shouldn't touch, like naked juice. He said, don't change the appearance of this. This is a original California product. Leave it as it is. And then he said, if you really care for design, the designer that you hire should be top notch and you should get personally involved in it and show your passion. Don't just behave like a corporate executive. Visibly show your passion. Now, I can't throw things around and utter four-letter words because, you know, women are held to a different standard. Mm. But, you know, I had my way of showing my passion. But uh, he gave me great advice. I thought he um, was incredibly generous with his time. And I saw the best of the best of the best of Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have never forgotten that interaction. My only regret is I didn't take a picture of myself with him. That have been something I treasured for the icon that he is in the world today. 
Wow, a great story. Um, you know, you just mentioned something here. Sorry, did you want to no. ask? Uh, you admit just mentioned you know women are held to a different standard, and this is you know wh- I want to get into the gender part as well. Um, but I think balancing family and professional career, I will say. uh you are the one person who you know when i read your book or even interviews i strongly resonated with because mm-hmm. i've always you know for me i always uh, considered myself i love working i i really enjoy it i love taking on really b- interesting big challenges when i get promoted very similar to what you said i feel like oh my god i need to really succeed at this how do i do that how do i put in more hours how do i learn more and then you know once uh, we got married we have kids um it's not that the priority changes but there is this whole rejiggering and you need to like balance your perspective on like how you what you want to do how do you give 100% at work but also how do you think about family how did you deal with this and what do you tell people who are going through this journey well again going back to our upbringing in my case we came with nothing i mean i came with nothing i was a student and my husband was a student too when we got married i mean we had nothing yes yeah uh, two outfits in the closet we were quite happy i should say um and so we were building the career from scratch uh and when we started to have kids our only thought was how do we build a life for our kids where they're debt free we have a nest egg for them and their life is way better than ours was when we came here mm-hmm. as immigrants and so uh you know our focus was singularly on that and how do we make sure we have enough so that we never have to turn to anybody for help and this is where my in-laws and my parents all came in to help they said we'll help you mm. we'll help you care for your kids different aunts and uncles all took leave and came you know they had accumulated leave they all took the accumulated leave and came and helped you know uh, and i think that we benefited from the close knit families we both were mm. um you know they took turns sometimes my in-laws and their family came or my family and somehow they took turns and by having a family member at home all the time raj and i could both do what we needed to do now is that the optimal arrangement no but is that the best arrangement yes i don't see what's wrong with that because our parents all felt they were important mm mm-hmm. and the kids loved the grandparents um did they spoil them rotten yes <clears throat> but the kids loved the grandparents and uh, and so uh, it worked out okay without that extended family support uh, arthi i couldn't have done it you uh, famously said there's no such thing as work life balance no there isn't in those days because there was no technology at all right right so the smartphone didn't exist right and so it was constantly juggling priorities what am i going to change the next hour what am i going to change the calls come from the school what do i do now i think with technology and remote working you know partial remote working there's some semblance of balance that you can have hmm. so i'm more optimistic about what you guys are developing in silicon valley as technology they can actually make life easier for all of us what do you say um especially to you know young women who are graduating who are trying to enter the workforce what advice do you have for them as they you know scale into their careers think about families all of that and this doesn't have to be about balance but you know a lot of people look up to you yeah. and how does somebody aspire and become you you don't start by saying i want to be in red don't do that because the minute you say i want to be that you you lose perspective of the journey okay. you start to think of the goal okay let's not forget that organizations are pyramids they're not cylinders they're pyramids and so as you go up there's tremendous attrition so if you look at the pepsico entry level about 15000 managers yeah CEO minus 1 there's only 15 people yeah. there's one CEO so think of the fall off to reach the top is very 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 difficult so don't just say that's what i want to be i've decided because then you have to decide all the sacrifices you're going to make how you're going to manage life what's the infrastructure you're going to build around you if you want to get married have kids who are you going to marry that's supportive of you who's going to help you with the kids you got to think about all that mm. just let your life carry on mm. think about your priorities what do you want in life mm. there is a life beyond working 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 non stop think about your priorities and just let the thing drag along my only suggestion this is just me talking as somebody who seen too much i don't like women not being economically independent mm. 
Mm. You know, I uh, I think women should have the power of the purse. They should never have to put their hand out and be totally dependent on somebody else. Right. For their livelihoods and their life. Because if you hand off control too much, mm-hmm. okay, then it has its own set of consequences. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of stories recently about um, domestic violence in the South Asian community, which bothers me a lot. I mean, it's an it's a alien thing to me. Mm. And I sit there going, if women had economic independence, would there be domestic violence? And so I think in today's world, especially COVID brought all this to light and post COVID, I would just say women get a degree, get a profession, get a job, hold on to your paycheck. Mm. Wow. Yeah, makes sense. Um, what uh, I think, uh, you know, one thing Sriram had wanted to ask about, it's like a total segue, was cricket. And, yes, uh, oh, yes. and uh, yeah. you know, um, you're a board of ICC, we wanted to talk about, uh, you're also in your book too, you'd mentioned mm-hmm. about, you know, starting a cricket team, which completely unconventional, you know, especially yeah. at the time that you were in. What yeah. role did cricket play for you as, you know, through your career, uh, and, you know, where you are on the board and all of that. You know, it's funny because whenever before I was on the ICC board, I sit there going, I wish I could go to this match or I wish I could go to this match. And I was too lazy to go get the tickets mm-hmm. and go. And PepsiCo used to be a sponsor of a lot of the cricket. That's history of PepsiCo. I never went to any matches when Pepsi was the sponsor. I, I, I would say for everybody who grew up in India, right, you remember these iconic ads that show right. up. So, so much of my memories of uh, Pepsi are, you Associated know... Associated with cricket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yes, like, Sachin Tendulkar, the, yes. all the shots and the cricket. Yes. Iconic. Iconic ads, okay? Yes. But worldwide, we were the partners to ICC. Yeah. But I never went to any game because I didn't have the time. Time, yeah. When I was three years, I never went to any game. Then I become ICC board member. Now I say I can go Wait, to hold on. I, Then you became ICC board member. There's a lot packed in that sentence. The, so, and it just came like full circle. Oh yeah, I mean like I, I I love that story because here you are, you know, in your book you talk about like playing cricket and kind of like pushing through these gender boundaries and then here you are like decades later being like, well, I'm going to be on... On the board. For, on the board of, you know, for folks in my family, it's kind of the supreme organization kind of governing all of cricket. So, so how did it come about and how did that, what did it mean to you to be like, well, that young girl like you know she would be so amazed to see where i am now i you know i got more uh bav you know more respect from my family <laughs> for being on the icc board than i did even being ceo okay here's the problem this is the first time i went to any world cup games yeah because i never had the time so you see it doesn't matter what you're on the board of and what you have access to you just don't go to it but i watch them all on willow tv when it's here and um, you know, I, I've followed Chennai Super Kings in the IPL. I, um, you know, watch India play in big tournaments. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I enjoy watching cricket. And, uh, you know, it, it brings me uh, memories of growing up in, in, in Madras when there was no ODI, there was no uh, T20. There was just mm-hmm. five-day and three-day matches. Yes, I remember. Yeah. And I remember all the uncles taking holiday and coming to go to Chepauk and. Oh, yeah. Different boxes used to be ready. They would all t- pack lunch and take it to the <laughs> stadium for lunch and tea breaks mm-hmm. and awesome. come home and analyze the game for three hours. <laughs> so we listened to all this. So we were all steeped in cricket, which was like religion to us. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was no TV. It was all cricket commentary on the radio. Yeah. So everybody had their ears glued to the radio, listening to cricket commentary on AM radio. There was no FM, remember? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the signal used to vary. You're all too young to this know. This is a bit before our time. This is, our time. This is a bit mean, before uh, your time. We had no FM. We had only um, medium wave band radio, not even short wave uh, for local cricket. So the signal yeah. would always be, uh, you know, sort of iffy. Yeah. So you all put your glue your ears and listen to the game. And <laughs> that's what life was about. There was no other sport oh, in India. Man. I like telling our American friends, yes, they play for five days and it ends in a draw and it is amazing. Yeah. Uh-huh. And people right. like, you folks And they are- score 600 runs and it still ends in a draw. <laughs> uh, and we love it. And people like, oh, that's crazy, right? Um, <laughs> it, it may be one last theme, you know, and you know, I was telling you recently, I was watching your masterclass, uh, which we folks haven't seen. Highly recommend it. It's amazing. And I watched yeah, so and much. And also the book, My Life in Full. The, the book. Fantastic. Uh, and one of the things which really strikes me, and I think is evidenced by this last hour you've been so gracious with us is how effective of a communicator you are, right? Both written, but obviously verbal. And I know it is a studied 
uh, discipline that you've worked on it over many, many years. And I'm sure a lot of people, I know we felt this way, you know, watching some of, you know, your videos yesterday, we're like, gosh, I wish I could have like the same amount of gravitas and present so well instead of like, I'm sort of weird and goofy and all over the place. Uh, and uh, she didn't even say no. She was like, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> so I'm waiting to, for you to finish. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was like, yeah, well, that's a, uh, too, late, too late, too late in there, too late. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, but for folks listening, what do you think they can do to present themselves verbally? What are things that have worked for you? How did you work on it? Because what, you know, it is so inspiring to listen to you. I'd be like, I would listen to this person. I would follow them into battle. And I know how much of a process it has been for you. So what tools, tips, techniques do you have for people listening? So uh, lots. To me, uh, investing in communication skills is very important. So I would tell, especially immigrants, um, you chose to come to the US. So work on your accent. I'm not asking you to adopt an American accent, but if you have very strong local language accents, work on it so that you become very understandable when you talk to people. Mm -hmm. Don't expect people to sit there and wondering, what did this person say? Work on your accent so you communicate very, very clearly. Um, get an expert to work with you on enunciation, how you mouth certain words that flow into each other. Work on all that. Get it out. I had the benefit of Irish nuns in my convent school in Holy Angels mm. who somehow adopted my sister and me and gave us elocution uh, lessons, almost have speech training lessons, got us to say V and W the right way, which very f many South Indians mix up. Yeah. And so uh, right at the time we were kids, these Irish nuns worked with us. So that helped us a lot. Third, when you're going to make a comment in a meeting, think about the comment you're going to make and why you're making it. Are you making it just to say I'm present mm -hmm. or are you making it to move the discussion forward? Mm. If you're making it to say I'm present, I don't care. It's a waste of time. But if you're making a comment to move the discussion forward, it better be clear. It better be understood. It better be linked to what the others have been saying so far. So you have to understand the purpose of your utterances. Mm -hmm. And if you go in there with such a purposeful approach, because you've read all the material, you know how to sit in the meeting, connect dots, and tell people, hey, guys, do you think perhaps we could advance the conversation this way? And let me tell you why. And then paint a picture of why you think your comment makes sense. So think uh, graphically, speak verbally. Okay, if you did that and leave in people's minds a picture, then you've actually accomplished a goal. Practice it at home. Mm -hmm. Practice it at home with each other. Practice speaking to a mirror and say, or practice, um, you know, do take a video of yourself, play it back and say, would you follow that person? Mm -hmm. Was that person clear? Mm -hmm. You know, if, this is a practice. And then watch the great orators. I mean, a lot of people talk about Martin Luther King. Definitely watch those tapes, but watch Vernon Jordan. The way he would stop and pause and if there was a point he had to make, he would make it three times. He would repeat that line three times by looking at different parts of the audience, mm -hmm. emphasizing the line with more and more power. President Obama, phenomenal orator. President Clinton, oh my God, brilliant. He made every person feel that you're a segment of one. So I think you've got to look at all of these, not for the messages they were giving, but the way they were communicating the messages. And then go back and say, how can I change my own approach? It's a trained skill. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have to have the ability to spend time to improve yourself. Wow. wow. Fantastic. That's amazing. I, I love it. Uh, by the way, I think this video oh. itself would be something people should watch. Uh, the part where you speak, uh, and uh, Arthi speaks, but you know, it just, uh, I would say, uh, it's such an honor and such a privilege every single time to uh, talk with you. It's, uh, we, I, I learn a lot. I personally learn a lot every time we chat, every time we do these interviews. I think about how <coughs> our audience is going to learn so much and derive so much value because growing up, this was really what we were looking up to. We were yeah. looking up to people like you, especially you, where for me, there were very few role models who were actually making it, getting into different industries and being in rooms where, you know, a few years ago, they had no business being a part of. And uh, doing that with clarity of purpose, being a really clear communicator, and above all, the confidence. You just had incredible confidence being there, doing the thing that you're doing. Every interview, every speech that you've given, 
it's just so inspiring and oh, uh, thank you thank you arti it it just comes from a place where you know i feel really good about our viewers you know learning from you here so thank you so much this is just such a treat for all of us Shri Ram Arti, thank you for having me. I'm still waiting for pictures of your kids. Yeah. It's coming. And I'm waiting it's coming. for that care package with badam halwa. I've not forgotten. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my gosh! Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. I have all those texts promising me all kinds of things. Uh, it's remember? A, yeah, this. Yes, I, I think we, we made, it might have been, uh, you know, lost intercept, in, intercepted, yeah, intercepted, intercepted, and eaten uh, at home uh, by me mostly. But uh, I, by the, I just want to say this episode more than anything else we've done. I mean, you're up there with Air Rahman, but we, we would. really really impress our artists parents back home so oh, which is definitely give them my best both your parents give them my best oh my god uh, thank but thank you so so much this is amazing until next time subscribe to the youtube channel uh, the good time show by arti and shriram